Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, my video is inspired by a feature in the Go 1.14 release that just came out, and that's embedding interfaces with overlapping method sets. It has a very simple, quick description in the release notes. A bit of a longer description is in the proposal that they link to. And what they're trying to point out here is that you can now have embedded interfaces that both define the same method internally. So for example here, read closer is a reader and a closer. And the traditional definition of read write closer has a reader, a writer, and a closer. Note here that closer just has close that can return an error. And the current definition says reader, writer, closer because you can't have it extend reader closer and writer closer because that would include closer twice and include close twice and that would have been a conflict. The new version could just be read closer and write closer for the read write closer because now they say it's okay if you included close twice. You probably meant it on purpose. In fact, you've said to the programming language, I know these things mean the same thing and that's why I've included them both here. Uh, now, there's another details here that you might want to look through. Another interesting thing to look at is that you can explicitly define your method even though it might be in an embedded interface because someone might add a new method to that later. And you might have wanted to mean the same thing, for example, in your string method here. So going back to this example, let's go look at how this looks when we actually use Go. So this right here is what we had before, read write closer with a read closer and a write closer. For kicks, I threw in a closer and an explicit close all at the same time just to prove we can do it. If I say Go build, it builds just fine. However, if I do want to have an explicit duplicate here, it says that I have a duplicate. And really, I agree with this decision because you probably did make a mistake if you included twice directly within the interface body. Now worth pointing out also that it would be compatible. If you're not compatible, such as leaving off the error return type, then it says, oh, six, seven, eight, these are all duplicates of your close method here. It would be nice if it said it's not compatible, but it just says it's duplicates. Maybe they'll improve that error message in the future. Anyway, going back to what we had that worked, that's great. Pointing out in Go 1.13, it does say we have duplicates here of everything after the original thing that included the close definition. So let's get back to our Go 1.14. Now worth pointing out here that there's no guarantee that close does have the same semantic meaning. So for example here, we might be opening and closing files that control our access to information. When you close it, we lose the information. But alternatively, we could have been opening and closing switches where if we open a switch, it's disconnected and we don't have a light turn on. But if we close it, it does connect and the light does turn on. These are very different semantic meanings for the two different kinds of close. And yet, technically, I can make an interface called switch and I can make some who knows what kind of monstrosity this would be that embeds read, write, closer and switch into the same interface. And it does build. This error is on me in the new version of Go that says, I shouldn't explicitly say these things go together if they have different semantic meanings. Now, sometimes we actually do find ourselves with different semantic meanings in a way that makes sense to go together. This is sort of uh, carrying things to a bit of an extreme here. Uh, but I just want to show uh, that technically you might get yourself tied up in knots. Now, in a large program, you might tie yourself up in knots accidentally. Here I've done it on purpose. We're going to use the monarch of multiple meanings in the English language, set, in order to do this example here. Let's pretend we have a spreadsheet and so we have a cell on our spreadsheet and get and set values. Or alternatively, maybe we have something that has sequences and a sequence might want to return a set of the unique values contained inside of that sequence. I'm not going to define a set interface at the moment here. The point is to describe what could happen or couldn't happen, not to actually make it run for the example inside of Go. Now say we had a sequence cell that stores some kind of sequence and so therefore you might want to get a set out, but it's also a cell that you can get and set values inside of. Now we've included two meanings of the word set in the same interface and because they're incompatible, we should expect to see here there's a duplicate method set. This is an issue that happens in human language as well. So for example, if we go to a dictionary, in this case I'm using Princeton WordNet of the English language, we might find definitions set of books, a set of golf clubs, or you might have a television set or a radio set. Or alternatively, you might set things down or you might uh, set the value of a state or so on and so forth. Uh, and this again gets back to all the different definitions of the word set. Uh, in terms of human language, it's interesting also to look at how deep learning plays this game. Older versions of uh, deep learning for representing uh, words for natural language processing models, there's something called word to vec that says, I can take a word and really there's a lot of nuance to human language. So we're going to represent each word in English language in this case as a 200 dimensional vector. 
And we'll see different clusters here. DS is 200 dimensions. I've only got three here. I'm using this uh, algorithm UMAP. This is just a TensorFlow demo. You can go visit this easily. It's taking these 200 dimensions and coalesce them down into three dimensions so we can actually look at them. And so we have different clusters here. Technically, hence, heavily, strictly, we're in adverb land over here. Over here, we have attorney, margin, presidency, voted, voting, lieutenant, rank, justice. So we get the idea that different clusters here have different kinds of meanings. Let's look for our word set. Okay, here we have the word set. And if we look at neighbors, we have odd, we have locally, partial, closed, numbers, numbers. So we're seeing here sort of a mathematical definition of set as a noun is what it has as its neighbors inside of this space. But realize we already knew there's different definitions for the same token set in the English language, which we also saw when we tried to make that sequence cell in Go. So more modern uh, deep learning models are able to account for this. I mentioned the transform model in my video about context-free grammars. And this right here, this model BERT, uses a transformer here. These are transformer encoders. And whatever sentence you start with, help Prince Mayuko, this is a starting token, it'll transform each of these words into vectors over a series of transformer encoders where it compares and modifies all the words with all the words at each step and therefore includes context in order to have a context-sensitive vector to represent any of these words. And one of the ways it trains these models is it masks out a word, and then the job of the model is to predict the missing word. So it can use a self-supervised method across just a bunch of text you throw at it to learn the patterns and how to express and understand the meaning of the words in a language. And nicely, to train it yourself, that'd be very expensive. We can come over here to Hugging Face, that's the company name, uh, that you can get a lot of pre-trained BERT models from. I highly recommend this. I'm going to use a BERT large case whole word masking. 340 million parameters, 24 layers of neural network, with an output of 1,024 dimensions on each of my words. Anyway, so let's take a look at this model here. So I can load up a model, BERT large uncased whole word masking, quick and easy. Let's go on ahead and calculate an embedding for the word set. If I go ahead and do this, notice I have the word set here. The token ID is 2275. It's an arbitrary number. Every input token, that set will always be valued 2275. There's our starting and ending tokens. And we get a three by 1024 uh, matrix out of here. So the three rows are for the start token, set, and the end token. And then this middle row here is the 1024 dimensional vector that represents the word set in the context of it being all by itself. Well, that's not quite as interesting as if we want to get a calculated embedding for a full sentence. I'll set the table, I apostrophe LL set the table dot with a starting and an ending token on it. So it gives us a nine by 1024 matrix where uh, the zero, one, two, three, fourth index is gonna be the number set or the word set. Now for fun here, I've gone ahead and gotten sentences. I'm going to set the table, the stage has been set. These are similar meanings for the word set. I set the value of the variable. We can set the value of the variable to X. That's another meaning of the word set. Or that's a set of all values less than five. Or zebra is included within the set of all animals. These also are similar meanings for the word set. So I have one, two, three meanings in my mind and two sentence examples for each. If I go ahead and calculate the similarities here, cosine similarity, uh, how close are the angles to each other inside of this 1024 dimensional space. We see each word is most similar to itself, but the first two examples of set the table or state has been set, they're most similar to each other. Sen word, uh, sentence one, the word set is closest to sentence two and vice versa. If we go look at sentence three and sentence four, we notice 0.68 is higher than anything else in their respective rows and columns. So they're most similar to each other as well. And then for the last two pairs, if we look at sentences, uh, five and six, we see again at 0.61, it's also ahead of any others uh, compared to the use of the word set in the other sentences. So this matches their expectations. And so we can see how computers can think about these multiple meanings in the same way that uh, we explicitly do it when we're programming. Let's actually go look at an example in C++ here uh, where we have a sequence of items or a cell of values, just like we saw before in our Go example, only now we have uh, generics through templates. And in terms of our subtypes here, I'm gonna use uh, virtual methods and inheritance, uh, somewhat for variety's sake from the concepts and uh, static generosity I've been using in other recent videos. So I can return an unordered set of items uh, from my sequence, or I can get a value and set a value for a cell. 
if I make an explicit sequence cell type here where I'm storing a vector of items, then I can get my items out. I can assign the new value of items. And really in C++, you'd probably use operators for this. But for the sake of the example here, I want to use words. And then I can also return a set of my items. In this case, I'll just return an unordered set of my items. The thing here is I made this explicitly complicated thing uh, on purpose. You shouldn't try to achieve these kind of complexities. Uh, however, in a large code base, you might accidentally get yourself into this kind of situation. So let's look at the example down here where we have a sequence cell of integers and I've put in values one, two, three, two, one into the sequence. I've set them. And now I want to get the set of values out. If I go ahead and run this, I'm going to see three, two, one. It's an unordered set. It happened to come out in this order. Sweet. That's what I expected to do using two different meanings of the word set. This works in C++ because C++ has overloading, unlike Go, which does not. And there's definitely pros and cons to this. So let's go a little bit into here in C++. One of the things that C++ gives you is because I define these uh, functions or methods in terms of certain classes, it sort of automatically namespaces these functions here. And here I've purposely chosen not to be clear. Sequence cell set, which one does it refer to? If I try compiling this, it says, I can't deduce which set you're meant. But we can explicitly define them as local variables. I want a pointer to function sequence set and a pointer to function for the cell set. In this case, I want to convert something to a set. In the other case, I want to set the value. So I can give them explicit names here to di disambiguate the meanings when I store them as local variables as function pointers. And then if I want to use them, I need to cast my existing sequence cell to either a cell or a sequence. And I could call the method directly, but for kicks, let's instead uh, call our function pointers to be explicit. We're going to set the value of the cell. Or we're going to convert the sequence to a set. I've made the sequence different here, one, two, one, so we can see different output to prove anything changed. If I go on ahead and run this again now, I see two and one. It's all that's in our set when we've explicitly called two set on our sequence. Moving on, let's go see how this works in TypeScript because TypeScript is different and that's sort of fun. Because uh, we're in JavaScript here, we don't have overloading, but we still can achieve the same effect through abuse. And, and again, don't do this at home. If you get yourself tied up in knots, it might help you out. Anyway, so I have an interface of cell where I can get and set the value or an interface of sequence where I get a set of items out. Again, two different meanings for the word set. And I can actually combine these into a common type uh, through an intersection type here and it works just fine. Interestingly, it complains about the conflict if I try to make an interface that extends both of them. It says that they are not identical in their types and therefore I cannot make an interface to extend both. But if I just do an intersection type, it's happy. And then I make a class that implements this intersection type. I can get the values or I can define one single method that has two different signatures for it. I can either set a value, which is an array of items, or I can get my set of items out. And the way I implement this is I make the value optional and if it's provided, I set the value. And if it's not provided, I return a set of the items. Ugly, ugly stuff, don't do this. There's a reason why they say prefer composition over inheritance. But this is my context. And if I go ahead and run this with a sequence of one, two, three, two, one, I get a set of one, two, three, just as expected. I've set the value here and I've gotten the set out. And before I'm done though, I want to move on to a language I read about before 20 years ago, but had never programmed in. And that is Eiffel. Back in 1997, Object Oriented Software Construction, the book by Bertrand Meyer, who's also the creator of the Eiffel language, won a Dr. Dobbs Jolt Award. This is back when there was a Dr. Dobbs and back when there was Jolt Awards. That is, it jolts the industry and makes you wake up. Uh, now this book here, Object Oriented Software Construction, uh, is a very large book, 1,296 pages in the second edition. I'm not sure which edition I read, but I read one of them. This is one big giant advertising pamphlet for Eiffel, and he has a business selling Eiffel as well. Uh, I love this uh, review here. This book is a throwback and fascinating because of it. Uh, for my demo, I'm not gonna use the official Eiffel. I'm gonna use Liberty Eiffel from GNU. And in Eiffel, I have to put each of my classes into a different file, sort of like you do with top level public classes in Java. If we come over here, I've got a sequence, which is a generic class, and deferred, meaning abstract, which is a sequence of elements, and I can return a set of elements out of it. I can do a deferred class cell, which I can get any value out, or I can set a value. Then I can make a concrete uh, class sequence cell, which inherits both sequence and array, and a cell of array of elements. Uh, and I have my get, 
my set to change the value and my to set, yes. When you inherit from another class in Eiffel, you can rename the parent method to a different thing in the subclass. Sort of like what I did in C++ as local variables, but I can do this at the class level in Eiffel and disambiguate the semantics and the different meanings of these words. And uh, this is at least the first place I ran across this type of feature in programming languages. And this is matters a lot to Eiffel because Eiffel is object-oriented to its core and therefore cares about inheritance a lot. Now, if I want to go use this inside of a program here, I can make a local sequence cell uh, from an array of one, two, three, two, one. And for kicks, I'm going to cast this to sequence of integer. Now, remember inside of this subclass, it's called to set. But in the superclass, it's just called set. And notice here this out, that just means to string. I'm going to convert it to a string. I'm going to call the set method on my sequence, which is going to call to set from the subtype. And if I go ahead and run this, I'm going to get out of here a hash set of integers of one, two, three, which is the set that I expect to see. So anyway, I found this an interesting thing and I was sort of happy to try out Eiffel after all these years. And maybe we get a chance to look at it again in the future if we get a chance to talk about formal verification and can compare that with the design by contract in Eiffel. Could be fun. Bye, y'all.